my job is really to, to interest you in a, what's going to be a forthcoming series of events around Imperial to do with the uh, centenary of the, of the First War. And I hope in the discussion session, any ideas you've got for how we can uh, commemorate this centenary uh, will hear. <coughs> because uh, Imperial, in fact, played a very significant role in, in, in that First War. First of all, our, our founder, R Richard Burton Haldane. How many people have heard of his name? Oh, uh, well, uh, for, 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 he was perhaps the Briton who did most to influence world history in that generation <coughs> because he designed the British Expeditionary Force uh, of 100,000 <coughs> troops which were in line in Belgium, northern France, within 15 days and played a phenomenally important role in the, the German psychological collapse, uh, the uh, Battle of the Marne. So uh, Haldane, in fact, was the main driving force behind the foundation of Imperial College. And, and later, uh, c c and other contributors to that, that first war period were uh, Almroth Wright, the pathologist over at St. Mary's, who developed the typhoid and the tetanus uh, uh, <coughs> vaccines. And uh, Corporal Tucker, as he became in the physics department, who developed a microphone for sound ranging for identifying where enemy artillery was. And then, of course, uh, Alexander Fleming, who, uh, whose uh, laboratory is over in, uh, in uh, St. Mary's, who uh, worked uh, in the mobile path labs, which were an innovation in the First War, and uh, the discovery of penicillin, really, which was in 1929, grew out of his work in that First War. <coughs> so we have a lot to... Uh, to look back on uh, as very important achievements around Imperial at that time. Well, what about war, medicine, and innovation? <clears throat> well, the first uh, hero I want to bring to your attention is actually uh, not on land, but at, at, uh, on sea. And that's uh, Dr. James Lind who did the first trial, one of the first medical trials of the use of lemon juice to uh, prevent scurvy, wasting disease, which affected uh, <coughs> sailors. And uh, he, was he and others were responsible for remarkable improvement in health in the 18th century Navy, which is uh, perhaps the first big public health success the siege of Cartagena in, uh, in Colombia in 1743. 50% of the uh, British sailors and troops died of yellow fever and, uh, and other diseases. By the time of the, uh, the blockade of Toulon and Genoa by <coughs> Nelson and, and his uh, colleagues in 1801, uh, ships were... Uh, uh, and crews were blockading for 18 months with very little chance to, to leave the ships and there were no deaths from disease. This was a, a remarkable performance <coughs> but it had, this uh, Navy success had little effect on, uh, <coughs> on, on, on civilian uh, health care. Where it did have some effect was on the British Army where an innovator and driving force, Robert Jackson, Dr. Robert Jackson, did pioneering search on the sanitation and on the location of camps because the uh, uh, <coughs> death rate among British soldiers in the West Indies and in India had been extremely high in the 18th century. And he changed the locations to more uh, healthy environments uh, which is very positive, but again, this had little effect on civilian health care. Where military medicine and events really started to have an event was after the, the Crimean War, uh, now back in the news, with uh, the battle for the Eurasian landmass goes on, 
It's been going on for centuries. Uh, <clears throat> but in the, after the Crimean War, there was what might be called the Nightingale Revolution in hospital building. Uh, which has left us some of our, our largest hospitals in London still. Uh, St Thomas's, King's and the London Hospital are all part of that uh, wave of change and some of the extensions at St Mary's uh, as well. And uh, she also promoted the Metropolitan Asylums Board, which was the first open access, free, non-poor law hospitals including St Stephen's in the Fulham Road, where the Chelsea and Westminster site as it now is, and uh, <coughs> New Cross uh, down, near, down, in, down in Lewisham. Uh, <coughs> Roland Hill, the inventor of the Penny Post, stopped uh, uh, Metropolitan Asylum's Board Hospital build, being built in New End in Hampstead. There's nothing new about nimbyism. Not in his backyard. Um, <clears throat> so these these hospitals were were very successful uh, in reducing infectious disease, showing that uh, careful nursing and, and isolation of infectious patients did reduce incidence, and they started a, a, a very steady improvement in life expectancy. In 1880, life expectancy in England was much as it had been in the 1580s, around 45 for, for adults. Uh, it rose between then and 1939 to uh, 63, and it's since risen for men to 78, 79. But that earlier change is little recognized. We tend to think of history as beginning with the National Health Service. While, well, in fact, there was a lot of positive change, the National Health Service was building on <coughs> success rather than uh, the, being the sole initiator of, of success itself. And uh, uh, now we come to our imperial hero, the, the then rector, Sir Alfred Keogh, spelled K-E-O-G-H, who was... <coughs> the man most responsible for setting up uh, the first war medical system, which is in fact the <coughs> model for the system that we're still living with, the National Health Service, which entirely or mostly drawn from that first war experience. He in fact drew his, uh, <coughs> drew his main uh, uh, inspiration from the success of the Japanese army medical services during the Russo-Japanese War in, in reducing disease and improving, uh, <coughs> improving care. Uh, although he looked a, form looks a formidable figure, he was in fact a fighting innovator uh, who uh, also was a devout Catholic and a strong supporter of women's rights. Uh, during the, the First War, he started the what's still, in fact, the first all-women's uh, surgical hospital, which was in Endell Street. Now, what was the Keogh Revolution, which was uh, developed here? Um, well, first of all, it was about sanitation and the use of incinerators uh, to uh, eliminate the fly population. Secondly, it was about inoculation against tetanus, typhoid, 40,000 French troops died of uh, typhoid because of the lack of inoculation program compared with uh, 100 British troops on the Western Front, somewhat more in, the, in, the, in other theatres. It was also about equipment with the uh, <coughs> borrowing from the French of the, the concept of the steel helmet, which is reckoned to have saved 50,000 lives. The British steel helmet which was still in use by the Americans in 1941, uh, see uh, from here to eternity, uh, uh, was the most effective helmet because it could stop a bullet, while the, the German helmet, though it looked big and, and, uh, and, and strong, it was not so, uh, it didn't have that good quality ski, uh, steel. And the REMC also developed the, the box respirator for the tremendous and 
dire challenge of chemical warfare, which was faced in those days. So um, <coughs> uh, it was a time of uh, uh, enormous and rapid innovation. Innovation in uh, messages. We talk about self-management by patients. Well, <coughs> Kyo was a strong supporter of self-management by soldiers to improve their own health through uh, <coughs> better uh, 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 sanitation. Uh, <coughs> I am part of a group at, at, at Imperial who, who were researching on these issues, and Dr. Emily May, whose who's excellent book, Wounded, about uh, uh, the medical services in, in the first war, unfortunately couldn't be with us today, but I recommend her book, which was on the Welcome Prize shortlist. She's also a Chelsea fan. She said she'd, <coughs> she'd rather Chelsea won the league than that she won the Welcome Prize. <laughs> Unfortunately, neither of them. <laughs> <coughs> but uh, better luck next year. It is, in fact, a very good book, which uh, conveys a very strong impression of what it was actually like to be a stretcher bearer, a doctor, or a nurse uh, in the Western Front services. There is then uh, my, our colleague from St Mary's, Kevin Brown, the, the archivist, uh, who has uh, written a very good biography of Alexander Fleming called Penicillin Man. How many people have read that? Well, you, you, you've got... <coughs> it's a riveting book uh, <coughs> showing uh, what Fleming did and didn't do. Uh, <coughs> and, but he's also done doing further research on the First War and I've recently, in fact, has come out in the last week, my book on key sites in World War I, Our Land at War, uh, <coughs> which uh, covers the, the, the medical services, and some of these photos are taken uh, from that. That, uh, that uh, uh, is, uh, is a picture of one of uh, <coughs> Keogh's key programs, uh, <coughs> uh, the development of, of vaccines, uh, in a joint program with Park Davis, and it was partly at Millbank, the, the RAMC centre, and partly at St Mary's. They produced 10 million doses of typhoid. How they did it uh, is not clear. But it's an immense amount of work. Uh, <coughs> why the horses? Well... <coughs> Uh, the horses, uh, the, the um, doses come out of the lymphatic uh, uh, glands. I'm an economist rather than a clinician, so uh, our clinicians can explain that later. Horses are used, uh, were used in vaccine production, uh, which also helps to explain why the um, American pharmaceutical industry is based in New Jersey, because it was the point of intersection between scientists from New York and uh, potential ground for stables for, for large numbers of horses in the more open territory of uh, New Jersey. <coughs> but and that wasn't the only research effort, <coughs> uh, because one very big innovation, which is still growing with us today, <coughs> is uh, <coughs> evidence-based medicine. Because there were new problems that emerged during the war. One was uh, particularly as the war turned into a long siege in damp trenches with great numbers of insects. The louse-borne disease of trench fever became very serious. And uh, <coughs> these uh, elderly volunteers at the Royal Free who volunteered to take part in the experiment in which they were put, in, or put on uh, beds wrapped in blankets and 400 lice were put on their skins. Unfortunately, or fortunately for them perhaps, it didn't work. <laughs> the skins were too thick. <coughs> uh, the, when, when the lice were, got to the, uh, by then, mainly young conscripts of 18, 19, they had a fantastic meal. <laughs> <laughs> and the result was they had trench fever, which is a sort of debilitating disease. But this is an example of the kind of research program 
uh, which, uh, which developed uh, during the war. It was the first decade, in fact, of the, the Medical Research Council, which was started as part of the Insurance uh, uh, Act, uh, Health Insurance Act of 1910-11. Uh, th there were also pioneering research on the effects of smoking on, on health. Uh, the REMC, was there, they're having a vast number. There were two million uh, people treated for wounds during the war, another three million treated for disease. Uh, <coughs> the, the treatments were on the whole f successful. 70% uh, were returned to some kind of service and 90% uh, survived. But uh, they noticed fairly early on, because this was the first era that people were of mass smoking, and there was a great deal of smoking on the Western Front, that the survival rate of soldiers who were smokers seemed to be much less good than that of non-smokers. And uh, the, the RAMC, unfortunately, was not successful in discouraging smoking, but uh, it was an early example of a pioneering research in that area. But as well as, as, well as uh, the, 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 the research programs, there were also the treatment programs based on the principle of <coughs> having treatment as close as possible to the front line. This is actually from one of the base hospitals in London. The main treatment area was called a casualty clearing station. And in effect, they built modern hospitals in tents uh, for £20 a bed, compared with £1,000 a bed as they were in those days for uh, uh, brick-built hospitals, which were highly effective and as close to the front line as could be. The, the limit was if they were under shell fire, uh, there wasn't the stability for, for treatment and surgery. And this happened, in fact, during the uh, Passchendaele Offensive in 1917, when they had to move the, uh, uh, the, 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 the tents back because of the problem. By then, the, this casualty clearing stations had, had become, developed an immensely complicated support. Uh, it took uh, 250 trucks to move one. Uh, uh, they had tons of equipment, x-ray equipment, mobile labs, beds uh, <coughs> and, and a great deal of other, other equipment. But if, uh, as far as possible, they kept people in, uh, in France. If they got back to the UK, somehow they never got back to the front line. Surprise, surprise. <coughs> they found a way of filtering themselves off. Uh, <coughs> but if they were uh, serious long term, they had to be brought back to the UK. And this is an example of uh, the kind of uh, magazine they had in the Wandsworth, Third General Hospital in Wandsworth, which was one of the uh, largest. And they might also have been treated in the excellent Endell Street Hospital, which carried out 60,000 uh, surgical operations. Uh, it was entirely staffed by, by women surgeons. Uh, and the first in its world in the world uh, at that time, and uh, <coughs> and and uh, <coughs> once uh, they they were recovered. Uh, another innovation in in the uh, <coughs> first war was an enormous rehabilitation effort involving massage. Uh, not only the usual gymnastics, Swedish exercises, but also uh, they put great stress on sports and entertainments. Uh, even at the end of the war, when they're very short of manpower, they didn't stint on having divisional entertainment troops that did music halls. They found the morale of soldiers rose greatly uh, once they'd been to these, uh, these shows. And uh, so in Eastbourne was, was the centre for, for, for developing rehabilitation. Uh, so the first war uh, left, left as a legacy, legacy of aspiration. One of the best known 
books summed it up as the triumph of the doctor. The 19th century was not seen as the triumph of the doctor. Many reports were uh, <coughs> negative, particularly the Flexner report in the US. But the First War uh, had, had, was a huge success in terms of successful treatment of, of the wounded compared with anything and prevention of disease, which had normally uh, uh, killed as many people as had actually been killed in, in, the, in the fighting. And even when the flu epidemic came, there were only uh, all the, 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 the deaths in the British Army, which by that time was 2 million, were limited to 4,000, compared with 10,000 in a much smaller American force. It was a much more effective treatment uh, that, that was available in this now greatly enlarged system of 350,000 <coughs> beds in the UK and 70,000 in casualty caring stations and base hospitals in France with a total staffing of around 500,000. This example, the kind of exercises uh, <coughs> that they were doing there. And <coughs> this was another byproduct of the war, the, the much more testing and grading of individuals. This is an example of a <coughs> I own a rare report by the Ministry of National Service on 2.2 million medical examinations of uh, <coughs> people uh, <coughs> who were conscripted from 1916 to 18. By then, only 30% were considered to be grade A, that is, ready for immediate frontline service. And <coughs> the rest were in the other grades. Grade B was... <laughs> fit for some kind of service, grade C only light duty, and grade D not fit for anything at all. There were quite large regional differences. The fittest groups were clerks in Kingston-on-Thames and Welsh coal miners. <coughs> the unfittest groups were uh, men from Lancashire, from the cotton, uh, cotton industry, uh, <coughs> which perhaps explains why Lancashire has been the the, the, the Centre for Orthopaedic Development uh, over time, when the first the Thomas Splint, then the Charnley uh, hip implants, the very wet weather, plus, uh, plus rheumatism and, uh, and occupational uh, hazards there. So this is an example of the kind of uh, <coughs> grading they were doing, and there was much more elaborate grading for one of the most difficult areas, and that was uh, the choice of pilots, where... Uh, uh, the, in fact, uh, we have a vision of uh, the, the Battle of the Aces, <laughs> uh, the sort of uh, um, uh, high in the sky. But in fact, many more people were, were killed during training on landing and by unexplained blackouts while climbing high, the height factor and the lack of oxygen. So the, uh, and there was a great deal of work on how to improve oxygen access for pilots and tried to determine the psychological uh, background that would uh, produce a pilot. Uh, in fact, some of the aces seem to be complete psychopaths. <laughs> so, so the psychological trials were not, not all that uh, successful. But uh, the, 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 uh, the use of IQ, psychological testing, uh, uh, interview boards, grading became far more sophisticated during the war. Now, um, what about, what about the, the Second War, <laughs> finally? Uh, and I, 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 um, our research shows that... <laughs> The first war was the key area for innovation and leading to long-term civilian consequences with a kind of four-stage model that we're still struggling to get to today, starting with prevention, sanitation, then moving to early diagnosis, uh, and then to active treatment as soon as possible, but in concentrated centres which have expertise to deliver a lot of treatment. Obviously, the casualty caring station is the ancestor of our concentration of stroke care policy that uh, we have in London, as are moving on to other areas like cancer surgery. And then, uh, <coughs> then finally, um, 
care programs, rehabilitation, which uh, the NHS could, I think, learn quite a bit still from, uh, <coughs> from, the, from uh, what was done in the First War. And in many ways, the Second War, though that's because of uh, the perhaps hype of penicillin, uh, <coughs> adopted many of the same models uh, as the First War, but obviously had quicker movement with even more ambulances. They had quite a lot of ambulances then. Uh, the Second War had uh, different kinds of wounds from really serious blasts, uh, not just fragments, and from burning fuel, uh, which was not so common in the, in, in, in the First War. Uh, and certainly uh, blood transfusions helped with these massive systemic shock issues. Uh, the, uh, the official guide to blood transfusions and penicillins ten, tends to denigrate what was done in the First War, but in fact uh, the management of, inf of wound infections uh, made great advances in the First War. They, they uh, abandoned the Listerian methods of using antiseptic because Fleming proved by making a glass uh, wound and seeing whether liquid got to the crevasses, that you left little bits of uh, bacteria in the, in, at the edge of the wound. Uh, and the way to, um, to deal with or wound infection was first of all through tetanus injections and then through, uh, uh, through irrigation of the wound with hypochlorite of lime, Carol Dakin solution, and then suturing the wound. That was very effective in reducing sepsis. So it's a bit of a myth that control of sepsis only began with penicillin. Penicillin was, in fact, had su much superior effort against systemic infections than against uh, <coughs> the sort of wounds there were in the, the First War. But blood transfusions were certainly a great advance. Uh, they had just begun them at the, the, the end of the First War, but they had not clear, got on top of the blood grouping system. So it was a little bit of a hit and miss area, and that only came in the 1920s. Uh, <clears throat> perhaps the single um, greatest change was the use of penicillin. So um, we have a system, uh, out of the Second War came a faith in wonder drugs, which perhaps we're still trying to shake off, uh, and, and the idea that health comes about through dramatic interventions to beat severe infections. That was a very different view from that in the First War, where health came about through a team effort over a period of time, uh, and in which very effective nursing was, 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 a, was a big part of it. So um, uh, that, that is the, uh, the, these, those are the innovation areas that we, we have been looking at. And we hope very much uh, that we will have some kind of exhibition about the Imperial and St Mary's contribution, which was vast to, to better services.